Well, looking forward to a new series that will start right after Labor Day, and I'm looking forward to the fall. I'm more of a fall and winter guy. Anybody else kind of more fall and winter people? Yeah, amen. Okay. And to be honest, you know, pastors don't like summer because uh, so many vacations, people out, you know, kids. When school starts, you know, then, then church really starts to happen that time of the year. So it's really fall, leading up to Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, really is the best time of the, of the year. But uh, this is going to be a great year. We're going we're gonna to end this year well, uh, just feeling my spirit. And next year, 2020, uh, it's a year of vision, right? 2020, uh, it's a prophetic year. It's going to be a blessed year for the work of the kingdom. Uh, I'm really trusting, and it'll be a blessed year for you and for me. It'll be a, a year of spiritual battle and spiritual conflict and spiritual victories. And so we're going to have to be in preparation and prayer uh, for 2020 and what the Lord has in store for us. Uh, I want to preach to you today. Hey, by the way, how many of you enjoyed Tommy Barnett, those of you that were here last weekend? Wow, what a guy, what a guy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, looking at my son, you know, up here doing the offering, I, th- I think, wow, he's so young and good-looking. You know, uh, youth is so radiant. Uh, we're jealous of you young people, I'll tell you that. Uh, but I was thinking when I was his age, I was in Bible school, and I was preparing to be a pastor, and I was studying, and Tommy Barnett was one of my favorite preachers. Now, he's one of the all-time greatest pastors in America of all time, and one of the greatest preachers of all time. And he's still going strong at 81 years old. And I remember as a young man, young Christian, uh, listening to him, I remember the messages he preached to this day. I remember being in one of his services in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just weeping. And I thought, wow, I, I want to be a pastor. I want to be able to preach almost like him one day. And, you know, I, I want to be a, a spiritual leader like him. And, and to think that I'm a part of this great church in this great city. And I am now, I've been over the last, you know, many, many years, and been able to invite him to come to our church and to preach in this pulpit. It's a blessing, and it's a treat. You heard one of the greatest pastors of all time, and what a joy and what a blessing. But I want to preach to you today about overcoming obstacles. And we're going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57. So out of love and respect and esteem for God's word, please stand to your feet. We'll begin reading verse 14. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry, for then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the prophet Isaiah. We thank you, Father, for the sermons, the prophetic messages that he proclaimed. We thank you, Father, for his insight and his foresight. We thank you for the foretelling and the forthtelling that comes from his glorious book. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's inspiration that inspired this man of God to preach what he preached. And now, Lord, we have the privilege of studying what was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Thank you that we have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit is saying to our church today. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. And all of God's people said, you may be seated. I love verse 14 of Isaiah 57. It said, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. Life has obstacles. Life is like an obstacle course from the time you come into this world to the time you exit. In our life coaches training, the training program, the certified training program that we have here at the church that we provide once a year, Uh, We have an exercise where we break up all the trainees into teams and we create an obstacle course, chairs and microphone stands and whatever we can find. And uh, we break up into teams 
And each person has to put a blindfold on, and they have to navigate the obstacle course with their other team members and the team captain shouting instructions at them while the other team captains are shouting instructions to the others. So it's mass chaos. It's fun. Nobody's been injured yet, thank the Lord, right? Uh, but that really is what life can be at times, an obstacle course. And sometimes we need to hear and listen to the voice of our shepherd to guide us and to navigate us through the perilous times that sometimes our lives experience and go through. So what's an obstacle? It's an impediment that is meant to not only slow you down in life, but to stop you. Frank Clark said, if you find a path without obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. And there's a lot of truth to that. The fact that you're facing obstacles in your life may be proof positive that you are on the right path that God has for you because there is no easy way or easy road. But yet God promises to make a way in the wilderness. Now here in the book of Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah is an amazing book. It's called the mini Bible because there are 66 books in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, 66 books. The prophet Isaiah has 66 chapters. So his book is divided into three sections or three categories. Chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah is preaching to his people, to his generation, what they were going through right, right there and then because of their rebellion against God, because of their sin, God was sending them and, and sent them into exile, and they were going to be there for 70 long years. So chapters 1 through 39, uh, Isaiah is preaching to the people where they're at in the time that they were living. But in chapters 40 through 55, Isaiah begins to prophesy and preach about a future generation, what God has in store for that next generation, providing them hope that it's not always going to be the way it is right now. But then in chapters 56 through 66, that's like the greatest section, you know, of Isaiah's prophecy of his sermon, because in those chapters, Isaiah is preaching hope, preaching the glory of God, preaching the coming of Messiah, all that God has in store for his people, and they are glorious chapters. So in chapter 57, the verses that we just read, uh, it's a part of that section. And it's filled, it's filled with hope. It's, it's filled with optimism. It's, it's filled with what God is going to do, that he is going to heal you. But there's going to be some obstacles. As this new generation makes its way back to the promised land, it's not going to be in the condition, you know, prior to the Babylonians coming in and destroying. It's not going to be like it used to be. There's going to be some hard work, some rebuilding, but God is promising in these final chapters revival because God is a God of revival. He's a God of renewal. He's a God of restoration. And Isaiah is promising that. You know, we talk a lot about revival. And, uh, you know, what is revival? Jesus compared revival to the Holy Spirit like wind moving. John 3.8, he says, we don't know where it comes from. In the Spirit, in the moving of the Spirit, we don't know where it comes from like wind right? We can see the effects of it. We can hear it. We, we, can, we can feel it at times, but we don't necessarily know. We don't know where the wind comes from, and we don't really know where revival comes from, but we know the effects of revival, but we know revival like the wind does come, and when God breathes a breath of fresh air upon our soul, upon our lives, upon our churches, upon our nation, we know that we are experiencing revival. But if you drive by a church and they have a sign out front that says, revival meeting start next week, you can be assured there's no revival at that church because you and I cannot schedule revival. We must pray and only God by his spirit can birth revival. And all the people of God said, amen. And Isaiah was promising this generation, this new generation, that they were going to experience revival, but there were going to be some obstacles in the way. So build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way. Obstacles are really put in our way to see if what you want is really worth having, to see if you really, really want it. Uh, there's a, a great leader that lived a long time ago, Marcus Aurelius. 
His writings are still with us, and we could read from this Stoic philosopher the things that he learned. But he was a real person. He led his people during war and famine and pestilence. And he says this, a famous quote concerning obstacles by Marcus Aurelius. He says, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way that the obstacle in your path can actually serve you to make you a better person as opposed to making you a bitter person. That you can actually go from tragedy to triumph by way of going through the obstacle. That trials can turn your, your faith to gold as we understand through the teaching of Scripture. There was a wise king that ruled once, and his people uh, began to expect more and more handouts, began to expect for the king to take care of them, the king to provide for them. And little by little, they refused to begin to take ownership for their own life and to take responsibility for their own life. So the king wanted to teach them a valuable lesson. So one day, the king put a large boulder in the middle of the main thoroughway, the main road. And on both sides of this road, there, were, there was a steep cliff. And you could barely, barely inch your way around this boulder to get on the other side of the road to continue your journey. Day after day, people would come, and they would see the, that big boulder in the middle of the road, and they would grumble, and they would moan, and they would groan, and they would complain. But nobody did anything about it. So finally, the king called all the townspeople together together, And on that day, by himself, with great effort and great struggle, the king eventually was able to move the boulder out of the way. It took a while, but without any help, he did it on his own. Then he knelt down and picked up a bag, a a black bag filled with gold. And the lesson he taught his people, if they were willing to remove the obstacle in their way, they would have found a hidden treasure. I think that's the great truth in life, that if you and I are willing to work through the obstacles, overcome by God's grace the obstacles, there is a hidden treasure for us. It lies beneath the obstacle itself. Because sometimes our King, King Jesus, will put an obstacle in your way to test you, not to disapprove of you, but to approve of you. So Isaiah says, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. Because what stands in the way becomes the way. So what lies in your path? Is it some disability? Is it some some financial challenge? Is it a fear? Is it race or gender, poor education, broken family, bad upbringing? abuse. Hey, we all get it, right? Life isn't fair. Life can be difficult at times. I'm reading through the book of Job right now in my devotional reading. That's some heavy-duty reading, reading through the book of Job. And all that this one man suffered, and yet he didn't sin against God. And yet he didn't blame God. And yet he didn't falsely accuse God. And even when his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Job refused to renounce his faith in God and in God's goodness. And when you get to the end of the story of Job, you come to realize that once he made it through this difficult time and difficult trial in his life, there was a hidden treasure for Job. And he was doubly twice blessed at the end of his life than he was at the beginning of his life because God saw him through. And God can see you through. Now, all of us love to read biographies of famous people. You know, one of the exciting blessings of reading Scripture and studying Scripture is that these are real-life human beings, real-life people, men and women, just like you and just like me. It says of Elijah, he was a man of like passions. He had his temptations. He had his struggles. He even entertained suicide at one point in his life when he couldn't take it anymore, and God came to rescue him. 
He was a man of like passions, and yet he was a powerful man of God. God used him in such incredible ways. But he was ordinary. He was a man of real flesh and bone. The men and the women in the Bible were men and women of real flesh and bone. They were ordinary men and women that did extraordinary things because of their faith in God. And so we, we are inspired by these biographies uh, uh, of the people in the Bible, but not only people in the Bible, but, but people that have lived in history. You know, you've read after certain people that have inspired you at, at difficult times in your own life. In the Bible, men like Joseph, he had to overcome betrayal, the obstacle of betrayal. His own brothers betrayed him and sold him as a slave. He had to overcome the obstacle of being a slave. He had to overcome the obstacle of being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and being thrown in prison for a crime he did not commit. But in each and every circumstance, the circumstance didn't get the better of Joseph. Joseph got the better of the circumstance. Joseph held on to the dream that was in his heart. My friend, are you in the great struggles and times of difficulty in life, are you holding on to the dream that God has placed in your heart? Never shrink from the adversity. Never, never back down. Never fold up. Never give in. Keep, like Joseph, keep plowing ahead. People like Esther, as I mentioned, people like Job, all of them faced. Esther, she didn't know her father and her mother. She was raised by her older cousin Mordecai. And yet, God graced her life and God blessed her life. And through great struggle, she ends up becoming the queen of the most powerful kingdom in the world at that time, and she saved her people, but not without some pain, not without having to go through, go under, go around, go over the obstacles in life. Benjamin Franklin once said, the things which hurt instruct. Our greatest lessons come from the difficult, hurtful times in our life where we can harvest a valuable lesson and wisdom that God has for us. You know, I believe our, our biggest challenges in life, our biggest barriers, our biggest obstacles in life since we won World War II, since the end of World War II, our biggest challenges and our biggest struggles in America today, since we won World War II, are not external, they're internal. I know you have so many people in our country today that are moaning and groaning and complaining because there's some impediment in their way. There's some stone. There's some rock in their way. And they want somebody else to remove it for them. They want the government to remove it for them. They want their parents or a friend or a pastor or somebody to come along and remove it for them. God wants to give you the creativity. God wants to give you the, the strength. God wants to give you the vision and the power and the ability to remove those obstacles with God's help. You don't need to wait for somebody to come and rescue you. Christ has already come. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Some of you can remember when there were no cell phones. Life was a lot simpler back then. Some of you can remember when there were no washing machines. Some of you can remember when there was no air conditioning. Some of you can remember when times were much more difficult than they are today, and yet today there's a long list of the things we have today that are at our disposal that have never existed in the history of mankind, and yet we have a nation full of moaning, groaning, complaining men and women. Why is it that millions of people are trying to sneak in to this country and not sneak out of this country? Because this is a land that flows with milk and honey. It is the most blessed nation in the world with all of our hangups and sins and problems. It's still the best place to live. If you've traveled anywhere outside of the United States of America, God bless all the other nations, and God bless all the people of the nations, and God so loved the entire world, but I'll tell you what, we are still the most blessed nation in the world. The fact that you were born here or you live here, half the battles in life have already been won for you. Build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacle out of the way of my people. What stands in the way becomes the way. Beneath the obstacle, there's a hidden treasure, my friend. Don't complain about it. Ask God to give you the creativity, the strength, the ability, the ingenuity, the know-how, and the help if you need it 
to remove that obstacle that's in your way because it'll make you not a bitter person. It will make you a better person with the help of God. What stands in the way becomes the way. Biographies. People like Albert Einstein. Did you know he couldn't speak until he was four? They thought something was wrong with him. Benjamin Franklin dropped out of school at the age of 10. His parents couldn't afford to put him into school beyond, beyond the age of his 10th birthday. That didn't stop him. He ends up inventing, you know, uh, all kinds of things and becoming one of the founding fathers. Thomas Edison failed a thousand times until he, you know, finally created the light bulb. Vincent Van Gogh, right? He only sold one painting in his lifetime. Poor guy, only one painting. No wonder his paintings are so distorted. He was depressed, you know. But he goes down as like the most successful painter of all time, Amelia Earhart. You know, she was the first female to aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She received the United States Distinguished Flying Cross for this accomplishment. She set many other records. She wrote books about her flying experiences. She was instrumental in the formation of the 99s, an organization for female pilots. She did this in the, in the early part of the last century, right? The 20th century, the 1920s. Women didn't have the rights that they have now. They were not treated the way they, they are treated now. And yet, these obstacles didn't stop her. They may have slowed her down, but they didn't stop her. One day, the phone rang. A man on the other line offered a pretty offensive proposition. There was a philanthropist that gave a large sum of money and wanted to fund the first female transatlantic flight. The man on the other end of the phone told her, you're not our first choice, but our first choice backed out. But we're offering it to you. And oh, by the way, we're going to have two men in the plane with you. They're actually going to fly the plane, and we're going to pay them, but not you. Do you still want this opportunity? Without hesitation, she said, yes. Because she wasn't going to let an obstacle in her way slow her down, impede her, or stop her. She made history and she raised the bar for all women that would follow after her because she could not be denied or defeated or stopped. She knew beneath the obstacle lied a treasure, if not for her, for generations that would come after her. Build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. Remove the obstacles out of the way. So how do we do that? I want to give you the three O's for overcoming obstacles. The three O's for overcoming obstacles. Number one, outlook. Whew, outlook does determine outcome. Some people, they see a problem in every opportunity, and other people see an opportunity in every problem. I hope you're a person of faith and not a person of fear. Fearful people see a problem in every opportunity. Faith-filled people see an opportunity they can exploit in every problem. Outlook does determine outcome. It's all about attitude, my friend. Like Zig Ziglar used to say, you need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> it is attitude, not aptitude, that determines altitude. It's all about outlook. In Isaiah chapter 43, it would be the middle section of the book of Isaiah. He's preaching to future generations. He's preparing the generation that then was listening to his sermons, make it back to the promised land. He says this, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. What a message for us today. Forget the former things. Forget the job that did you wrong. Forget the boss that did you wrong. Forget the church that did you wrong. Forget the ex-spouse that did you wrong. Forget the neighbor that did you wrong. Forget the people that have hurt you in the past. Let it go once and for all. Stop dwelling on the past. The good, the bad, the indifferent. Why? See, I'm doing a new thing. Say a new thing. God is saying, I'm going to do something new with you, through you, and in you. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? No, some people can't because they're stuck in the past. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. 
God can make a way because he's the way maker. Where there seems to be no way, God can make a way. Listen, you might be knocked down, but you're never knocked out. Though a righteous man falls seven times, will he not get up again? Get knocked down, get back up. Get knocked down, get back up. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. If you won't give up, if you won't quit, if you won't throw in the towel, the Bible promises that God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. You were destined to win in the end. And what I want you to do is I want you sometime today or tomorrow or the next day, I want you to take out a sheet of paper, and I want you to put a header on that sheet of paper, what's your biggest obstacle in life? Then I want you to draw a line down that sheet of paper, and one side of that sheet of paper, based on your header, Based on your biggest obstacle in life, might be relational, financial, spiritual, emotional, mental, whatever it is, write it down. Then I want you, on the, one, on the one side of the column, I want you to write down, what's your current outlook? And how is that outlook serving you or helping you or benefiting you? Then on the second column, on the other side of that, that line, down the center of the page, I want you to write down a new outlook, a better outlook. And how, if you have a shift of perspective, how this new outlook, not a fear-based, but a faith-based outlook, how that might be able to serve you and benefit you, because outlook determines outcome. The next O in the three O's of overcoming obstacles is output. you got to do something, not just think something, not just pray something, not just ask for something. you got to pray as though it depends on God and work as though it depends on you. Because faith without works is dead. That is a biblical law and a biblical truth. So look at James chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 7. Give yourself completely to God. Watch this. Stand against the devil, and the devil will run from you. Woo-hoo. How would you like to see the devil running in holy terror from you? This is what James said will happen. Now I want to make a confession. I want to make a confession. In my entire life, in my entire life, I've never walked away from a fight. I've ran away from plenty of them, but I've never walked away. (laughs) I got a true story. I got off the bus and three guys were chasing me. I ran home to mama, literally ran home to mama, pounded on the door. I've told this story before, true story. Pounded on the door, showed them, I said, mom, these guys are going to beat me up. She goes, get out there and fight them. I'm like, what? You're supposed to protect me. She said this made me a better man today. Are you a man or a mouse? And I literally said, I am a mouse. Now let me in the house. <laughs> she wouldn't let me in the house until I went out there and found him. So I've never walked away from a fight. <laughs> but I have run. <laughs> and the devil will run from you. Look at verse 8. This is the first part of verse 8. Let's read it out loud together. Come near to God and God will come near to you. Listen, my friend, there's something about spending time in the presence of God that changes everything. You know, you can tell when people have spent time in God's presence, and you can tell when people haven't spent time in God's presence. Sometimes a wife has to tell her husband, you need to get along with Jesus. And sometimes a husband needs to tell his wife, you need to get along with Jesus too. Here's a hundred bucks. She'll say, it'll cost more than that, darling. <laughs> But you can tell people that have been in God's presence, people that have. Now listen, you can tell I've been in the sun. I don't usually look this dark. In Cabo San Lucas, the resort we were staying at, I was uh, coming out of my room. I had my hat on, sunglasses, and, and, you know, like tank top, whatever. And these four women just showed up. They were getting ready to go in their room next to our room. And one woman looked at me and she said, Hola. That means hi in Spanish. I said, hi, how are you all doing? And they had this look of surprise, like, he speaks good English. (laughs) I said, where are you all from? They said, we're from San Francisco. I said, oh, awesome, awesome. They said, you must be from Texas. I said, how'd you know? You all must have given it away. I'm I'm, uh, in the elevator. My wife's in the room. I'm in the elevator. I'm going down. A family of four, husband, wife, two kids, beautiful family, come to the elevator, and it's closing, but I hit it to, so it opens back up. I wanted to be, you know, courteous. And I, and I hit the button, close, and the man looks at me and goes, we're going up. <laughs> I said, 
awesome. And he looked at me surprised. The wife looked at me surprised, right? And uh, she said, thank you. I said, you're welcome. You guys have a great stay here in the elevator. They said, he must be a nice bellhop, you know, because he speaks really good English. Here's what you can't hide. When you spend time in the sun, it shows. And when you, it can't, you can't hide. You can't disguise. When you spend time in the presence of God, it'll not only change your outlook, it'll change your output. Hallelujah. Now, there's one verse we read at the beginning of the message in that section of Scripture. Look at verse 15 of Isaiah 57. This is awesome. So before you read it, though, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> where does God live? Like, where does God live? Everywhere. That's, 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 yeah, he's, he's omnipresent. You're right. Okay. Where does God live? Uh, like, in, spatially, where does he live? Uh, heaven. Come on, people. He's in heaven, right? And you can't get there. Physically, you can't get there. By faith, prayer, and praise, you can get there, right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, you know, come boldly to the throne of grace, you maintain grace in the So we understand all that. But physically, you can't get there. No one has seen God and can live. So God lives, get this, in two places. He lives in heaven. Watch, watch. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, place number one, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God lives in heaven, and God lives with people who are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. He lives among men and women who are humble and seek him with all of their heart. May God find a dwelling place here in Lubbock, Texas, here at Trinity Church, in your heart, in my heart, in your life, in my life in your home and in my home. Why? Because we're not prideful people. We're humble people. And our dependence is upon God. Our hope is in God. God is our provider. Not the government. Not some man. Not some job. Not some title. Not even some degree. Thank God for all that you've achieved and accomplished, but ultimately, the source of all blessings comes from God the Father who gives good gifts to His children. Hallelujah. And He's always in a giving mood. He's always in a giving mood. All right, the three O's. Outlook, output, and finally, ownership. Ownership. You know, they say the greatest, one of the greatest days of someone's life is when they come to the realization that blaming other people for where you're at in life doesn't serve you well. But taking ownership, taking responsibility for who you are and where you are and where you're supposed to go, that's a day of great liberation. Ownership. Look at Ezra chapter 10, verse 4. I love this verse. Let's read it out loud together. Arise, for it's your task. We are with you. Be strong and do it. Do it. We're here to support you. We're here to help you. But ultimately, it's your task. Your life is no one else's responsibility. Unless you're under the age of 18, then mommy and daddy better be there to help you, help you hopefully. But once you hit 18, you're on your own, right? Kids need two things. They need roots deep, and they need wings to fly. Roots and wings. And the time comes when they need to spread their wings, and they need to soar. They need to fly you got to arise. It's your task. Nobody else's. No one's going to come to rescue you except for Jesus, right? You can't look to the government. I'm tired of this, you know, <laughs> what the government's going to do for me. All these policies promising to give you more and more and more and more and more like we're a bunch of helpless ignoramuses that can't figure out things on our own, that we need some almighty government to come down and save us. Our faith is not in man. Our faith is not in the government. They have their position. They have their job. They're appointed by God. But ultimately, our source of blessing is not the United States government. Our source of blessing is almighty God. He is our Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord, our provider. 
And David didn't say the government is my shepherd, I shall not want. King David said the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack any good thing because God does not withhold any good thing to them that fear him. Ownership, arise. The rock in your path, the obstacle in your way, don't wait for somebody else to come and remove it. The king is there to help you. And with God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, you will remove that obstacle. I prophesy that over you. You, by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, will remove that obstacle, and beneath it, there's a hidden treasure. There's a blessing attached for you, for you. You're an owner. You're not a tenant in life. You're an owner. You're not a renter in life. You're an owner. You're an owner. No one owns you but God. No one ultimately can control you but God. You're an owner. You're not to be, you're not a, you're not a renter being paid out, paid, paid, paid out by the, by the highest bidder. You're, you're not a renter. <clears throat> you're, you're an owner. You, you have a sense of ownership about your life and about your own destiny. You belong here. You have what it takes. You can overcome. Turn to your neighbor and tell them with a smile on your face, you have what it takes. I, I could see it in your eyes. You're not a quitter. Go on, tell them, you're not a quitter. And I'm thankful you're not a complainer either. Go on, tell them, you're not a moaner, groaner, griper, complainer. Who is, you're not a victim. You're not a victim. You may have been victimized, but you're, that's not you anymore. You made it through. You're an overcomer. You're not just a survivor. You're an overcomer. Hallelujah. An overcomer through Christ Jesus. All right. I, I got to end here. One more, one more biography. One more true story. Reuben Hurricane Carter, <laughs> top contender for the middleweight title. At the height of his boxing career in the mid-1960s, he was literally falsely accused of a triple homicide. He was falsely accused and falsely convicted and sent to prison on a triple, triple homicide, three life sentences. He walks into the prison wearing a $5,000 gold watch, takes it off, walks into the prison, says, I want to talk to the man in charge. True story. Denzel Washington stars in a movie about his life. He meets the warden and says, it's not your fault I'm here. You didn't put me here, but I don't belong here. I'll eat your food, and I have to be in this place. I won't wear your clothing. And if anyone lays a hand on me, they'll pay the price. And he could back up his words. He spent the next 19 years in prison. He didn't moan, grope, and complain. Didn't play the victim. Didn't allow his heart and life to be filled with hatred. He was motivated. He saw the obstacle that there was a way that, that God could make within the obstacle that there was a way. He could overcome it. He began to read, he began to study, he began to study law. Nineteen years later, with the help of his attorneys, he walked out a free man. But you know what? He was always a free man because no one owned Reuben Hurricane Carter. He couldn't do anything about the people that put him in that prison. But he was in the prison, but the prison wasn't in him because the greatest challenges of your life, it's not what's out here. It's what's in here. And they couldn't defeat the man on the inside, no matter what they did to him on the outside, because he understood he was in charge of his life. He was the owner. And when he walked out 19 years, true story, 19 years later, he did not sue the penal system or the justice system. Why? Because he said, by me suing them, I would admit through that lawsuit that they took something from me, and no one can take something from me unless I willingly give it to them, and I didn't give them that satisfaction. Woo! You can preach that now. The three O's to overcoming. May they become your three O's to overcome whatever obstacle you are facing or you may face days, weeks, months, years to come. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today, and we just, we know you dwell amongst those who are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, those who are lowly and humble. We don't want to be prideful. We humble ourselves before you. Our dependency is upon you, God. 
Every good thing in our life is because of you, and we acknowledge that. And thank you, Lord, that beneath the obstacle is a hidden treasure for me today. May I not throw in the towel. May I not give up. By your grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may I persevere. For blessed are they which endure to the end, for they shall be saved. Thank you. There's a blessing upon the men and women who just keep on keeping on and by faith holding on to the promises of God. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior or you would like to rededicate your life to Jesus, we're going to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us, but you must say it with your own mouth, but most importantly, mean it from your own heart. And the God of glory will come into your life and change you, forgive you, heal you, restore you. The process begins today. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family? <clears throat>